our most serious health problem is cardiovascular disease. In recent years, it's been labeled an epidemic, but an epidemic based not on bacteria, but on our own bad habits. Epidemiologist Henry Blackburn, a University of Minnesota heart researcher, contends that this epidemic is a new phenomenon in American life. I think there's every evidence that this is a remarkable change in the human condition, that there was some fatty artery disease as far back as the uh, Egyptian mummies in the mm. privileged class. But in terms of epidemic involving 50% of our deaths, involving premature uh, disability and death, it is a modern phenomenon. And it is largely a post-World War II phenomenon. Hmm in its mass impact in do, Northern European and American countries. I see. Do we actually have evidence from back, say, in 1900, comparing it to what we know today? That evidence is not very good, as you know. The evidence of autopsies done in standard ways or clinical diagnosis in standard ways, no. I think by inference, however, from what we observe in other cultures that are free of disease and that have a lifestyle closer to our lifestyle at that time, there was virtually none, and there is virtually none in some of these cultures. So uh, it's not only a, a factor of better diagnosis and better medical care and treatment. Uh, there is every evidence that it is a modern epidemic. Huh. What, what did people suffer from then that the difference, now that we're dying of heart disease, what were we dying from in those days? As you know, the, the epidemic diseases, the mass diseases at that time were infectious and nutritional in origin. Uh -huh. And they are now so-called chronic adult diseases that are characterized by heart and blood vessel disease, mm -hmm. cancer, uh, chronic lung and liver disease, our major mm -hmm. adult disorder. Well, can one look at this as a fact that we, since we're not dying of pneumonia or tuberculosis, right. we have to die of something. Mm -hmm. So is it simply a matter of living beyond the time that we got the infectious problems that were so prevalent then, so that we're now living long enough to develop these? Or do you think there's actually been the entry into our lives of a new type of disease? Well, your question is, is very profound. Uh, certainly we are living a little longer. Most of that longevity is due to improved survival through infancy. Mm -hmm. But say that if one survived to age 20 or 30, around 1900, the longevity, the life expectancy, the survival was no better or worse then than it is now. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're having these chronic diseases now uh, in the adult ages is, is very likely a new phenomenon. We also find that in other cultures, in the seven countries where my laboratory has a systematic study going, that if there is absence of one disease, such as fatty artery disease or hypertension, there isn't necessarily some other disease that jumps in and replaces it. Up until recently, the laboratory approach to our chronic diseases has largely been a search for the magic cure. Yet the more we learn about the causes of these personal and public health threats, the more we're becoming convinced that prevention is the key. The factors behind our health problems have a history that dates back thousands of years. Our lifestyle now is far different from the lifestyle of our predecessors. Whatever theory of evolution or creation one embraces, uh -huh. Uh, it's very likely that humans lived as scavengers, gatherers, and hunters up until just four or five hundred generations ago. And that lifestyle can be described much differently. And the evidence, the fossil evidence, the anthropological evidence suggests that they were far more active than we. They were stronger than we. They had a rhythm of social life, activity, exercise, and rest. And they had a far different eating pattern. So these characteristics of lifestyle, the eating pattern, the physical activity pattern, the socialization, were quite different than that we've had since agriculture, civilization, and urbanization. Well, if life was so different, and I'd like to explore that further with you, then I assume that as we've changed, our physical and perhaps psychological ability to handle those things have not adapted. We, we can't change our bodies, our ability to withstand disease, as we've made these changes in our lifestyle? Precisely. There is every evidence to think that our metabolic adaptations, our strength, our physiology, our brain, uh, were somehow responsive to 
these major aspects of life, subsistence, energy expenditure to obtain food, uh, and the eating of food that we're exposed to over these eons of hunter-gatherer existence. These things develop relatively slowly, as you point out. We can adapt our social patterns, our cultural patterns more rapidly. We probably cannot adapt our physiology and our bi body chemistry to rapid changes. A rapid change in that sense, historical evolutionary sense, is a thousand generations or less. Mm. And we've only had agriculture for 500, we've only had industrialization for 20 or 30, and we've only had automobiles, automotion, automation for two or three. Mm. So these are far too rapid for our bodies to have adapted to these changes in our eating and exercise patterns. Let's consider, let's assume uh, that humankind was all hunter-gatherers. They, they didn't store food, they didn't trade food, they went out within a range around their water holes and they had their plant foods and they had their occasionally successful hunting sorties and they lived in perfect balance with their ecology and they didn't eat too much, they didn't strip the ecology, they didn't pollute, and they lived in a very natural way, apparently, uh, to survive, for humans to survive. Uh, suddenly, when we evolved to the extent of spreading out and developing specialization in crops, domestication of animals, we became more sedentary, more uh, involved in urbanism, urbanization, and we started treating our foods differently. Our physical activity became quite different. We had to salt food to preserve it, to trade it. We became dependent on single grain, monotonous single grain diets for the grain aspects, the plant aspects of our diet, instead of 50 different varieties of tubers and nuts and berries and fruits. Uh, so we began to concentrate on specialty grains, either corn or millet or, or wheat. We began to concentrate on specialty animals, domesticated animals, restricted animals, specially fed animals. And these were rapid, rapid changes in our eating and exercise patterns. The rapid change in life patterns which Henry has described has given rise to precursors, risk factors for heart attack and for cancer. We eat more food and are more frequently obese. We eat richer fatty foods and have higher blood cholesterols. We preserve and salt our foods, which likely results in higher blood pressure. And we exercise infrequently. In terms of diet, many researchers point to saturated fats and red meats as a prime suspect in the development of cancer and atherosclerosis. But man has been omnivorous for tens of thousands of years. So what's new? The great difference is that wild game carcass of wild game is not more than 1 to 2% fat, and it's almost liquid compared to domesticated beef that's, that's constrained and, and force-fed uh, grains and growth factors uh, in a particular environment that we now have due to our economy. So the, not only the amount of fat, but the nature of the fat has profoundly changed in just our lifetime. Uh, what would be the average saturated fat content of the domesticated cow or whatever source of meat that we're usually getting into now? From 20 to 30 percent of the carcass is, is fat, huh. and more than half of that is saturated fat. So you're going from 1 percent to perhaps 30 percent, exactly. and still talking about eating meat. So if, if one just said that it's not a difference because we're still eating the same kind of meat, in mm -hmm. fact, that's not true at all. We're eating it more often, and we're eating totally different meat quality. This is very recent. How about egg consumption? Is there any evidence that that's changed or have we always been pretty heavy egg eaters? The history of egg consumption is not well worked out at all. I okay. think it's very much like other animal products. We got it over time whenever we could. Man is not an obligatory animal product eater. Man is an opportunistic and the opportunity has vastly increased with our economy and with our, with our very efficient, marvelous uh, American agricultural system. So it's very likely that we raided nests and got birds' eggs, <laughs> but we didn't produce uh, 60,000 chickens in one pen and, uh, and uh, consume their eggs at the rate of three a day. You mentioned that salt was a precious commodity when we began yeah. to preserve food. Right. Uh, is the consumption of salt an increasing problem, do you think, that's added on to the problems of hypertension and perhaps some of the other diseases? Again, it depends on the time scale we're talking about. Every evidence is that salt was not 
regularly used or sought after by humans until agriculture came along and that we evolved or we developed or we lived in a relatively salt poor environments of East Africa and the Middle East, relatively high potassium and, and high vitamin, high plant food diets during these major phases of our metabolic adaptations and evolution. Uh, salt came in with vengeance, uh, with trade, and with agriculture. Still, the exposure to it was not very great for any individual because it was scarce. It was a commodity, as you know. I suspect that some cultures earlier than ours, say in the last two or three hundred years, ate more salt than we did now because they ate a little bit salted meats. Mm. The Japanese who salt all their foods very heavily and their traditional preparation of foods eat twice as much salt as we do. And they have more hypertension. And they have more hypertension. Yeah. But basically you're right that the salt consumption has increased in modern times mm. uh, and is still a serious problem mm. in Western cultures. Meat, salt, eggs, all part of our diet, all potential risks. But the difficulty in dealing with chronic disease is that there is no one single risk factor. Even after you've considered the foods we eat, there are still those other life habits to contend with. We've uh, talked mainly about diet. I guess a lot of other things obviously have changed too. Our general level of physical activity then has diminished and so that many of us are much more sedentary than was possible, I guess, for people living in those days. Well, anyone who's traveled from this country and you've just been to Mexico knows that most people are moving around most of the time. It's only an urban life, automated, modern, industrial life that we've stopped moving around entirely. Most people still have to walk to their fields and work all day long and come home. Uh, our physical activity is now almost entirely confined to leisure time. Very few occupations that have significant energy expenditure anymore. This is a profound change and it, it has occurred in a very short period of a generation or two. Can we blame Henry Ford for our current epidemic of heart disease? Well, all of these changes uh, are widespread and there are many things that have occurred simultaneously, uh -huh. but clearly the automobile, <laughs> the automobile culture and the design of Dallas and Los Angeles and other communities for the automobile has, is to blame uh -huh. for much of it. When did smoking come into the formula? And I've what, been trying what? to look into the history of smoking and it's not very clear prior to tobacco it's not even, although mankind has smoked other things besides tobacco for many centuries. Tobacco, of course, uh, came involved in the Western world after Columbus voyages. It was still uh, uh, not badly abused, if there could be such a term, until the cigarette came along, until the 20s and 30s. It took off with vengeance during World War II when ladies took it up and when many of us were given free cigarettes uh, <laughs> in the service. And it uh, climbed in absolute terms and per capita terms uh, very remarkably until most recent times. As we've discussed the, the various elements that are likely components of the overall mix that have led to our much greater frequency of trouble, heart disease, cancer and such, you did indicate rather quickly that the stresses per se, uh, psychological uh, stress, likely is, is another component of what's happened. Would you expand further, what is it about our lifestyle today that would, in a sense, be more stressful? I mean, after all, those people had to worry about their next meal and gathering their crops and all. They had to worry about a lot of things that I guess we don't. But in fact, are you suggesting that today's modern, urbanized, busy life is in, in, in fact more, stressed than, more stressful than what they experienced? I'm not implying that at all. Mm. Uh, I think there are different types of stresses. Certainly the stresses of those times uh, didn't upset the fabric of the community or the family to the extent of our modern stresses. To have your children stolen by a neighboring tribe is a terrible stress. <laughs> But uh, the transient, mobile society of our country breaks up the traditional behaviors and gets us out of a traditional rhythm which may or may not be healthy. 
I think there are many aspects of the variety of our modern life and the curiosity of our modern life that can lead to health-seeking behavior rather than self-destructive behavior. It doesn't have to all be drugs or frantic uh, rages. <laughs> Indeed. We've seen examples of absolutely frantic cultures, urban Japan, where they have no heart attacks. They have other problems, other chronic disease problems. We've seen other cultures where life is so bucolic and so pleasant in Eastern Finland, where they die like flies <laughs> with heart attacks and strokes. Mm. So we're all inherently convinced that stress is important for us as individuals. It upsets our biological rhythms. It leads us to eat unwisely, to be sedentary or depressed, to eat or drink or smoke. Uh, of course, it affects our personal health. But in terms of being a cause of our epidemic, heart attacks and strokes, and cancer, I think it's unlikely we can, we can, uh, we can attribute that to these so-called modern stresses. Mm. So while we can't blame stress per se for our diseases, it plays an integral part in the choosing of our life habits and what we eat, if we smoke, how we exercise, okay. if we drink, when we drink how we respond to daily experiences. John Farquhar, founder of the Stanford Heart Disease Prevention Program, has said, we often live as if our habits don't matter. They do. So does the environment we've constructed around us. How about what we're doing in the environment? Uh, everyone is obviously concerned about pollution and radiation and all that. Do you consider those things that are, that are coming forth from our modern lifestyle to also be a major factor relating to heart attacks and for we'll other? We've talked a little bit about the anthropology and a little bit about the epidemiology. Yes, I think the sociology, the behavioral, cultural, environmental aspects of lifestyle are critical and are principal factors in our epidemic of heart attacks and stroke and cancer. You suggested exposures, industrial exposures. We're just beginning to learn how serious that is in regard to cancer. There are also cultural exposures, supports for unhealthy behavior in advertising, in particular government regulations, in particular traditions, in a rapidly developing economy, in convenience foods. All these things that impinge on our life are environmental factors. Mm. When these widespread and sometimes very powerful influences act on top of a basic susceptibility, an inherited susceptibility that much of humankind seems to, seems to bear, then that results in mass disease and epidemic disease. Mm. There is no single answer to health, no one health risk to avoid. As Henry has written, our modern day problems are the result of unhealthy personal behavior within a polluted environment produced in turn by distorted mores, values and peer pressure, and all profoundly moved along pell-mell by commercial interests and their blandishments. That said, what can you and I do to improve both the quantity and quality of our lives? Well, the public health message is clear. Give up smoking. Eat a low cholesterol, low salt diet. Maintain a healthy weight. Exercise regularly. Reduce stress. Well, how can you and I do all those things? And why should we? Those are the questions we'll be answering in the following weeks on Here's to Your Health. I asked my friend, University of Minnesota epidemiologist Henry Blackburn, the question, who needs prevention? That's the real question, who needs prevention? And what are your strategies when you're dealing with the larger question? And I would like to describe an evolution in medical and in lay thinking in recent years where we're no longer concerned only with the patient who's been stricken with cancer or heart attack, though we have done so well in prolonging their life and their quality of their life. We're concerned with that individual in their environment. We're concerned with the individual who is at unusual risk of becoming a patient, the high-risk patient, to prevent the attack. But we're also concerned with that individual in his or her family setting, relationship to spouse and children. Concerned with that individual in the work site, 
the influences in the work site that, uh, that affect their health and their health behavior. Mm -hmm. And finally, to the community as a whole in terms of supporting unhealthy behavior or encouraging better choices and alternatives of health behavior. So who needs prevention? It's the patient who's been stricken, who needs to be <laughs> helped to prevent a second attack, and that's the medical job. It's the high risk, the particularly identified high risk patient with a family history of heart attack or cancer or stroke with elevated cholesterol or heavy smoking. Uh, this is a group that is becoming increasingly better handled by the medical system and by enlightened practitioners and group practices that identify risk and help funnel people into, into counseling appropriate to their risk. But there's a population view that you and I have been talking about in this series that, in, that suggests that we're all at relatively high risk mm -hmm. in North America compared to certain other advanced cultures. Thus, you could consider that our whole population is at risk. Uh, finally, there is the goal to prevent increased risk in the first place. <laughs> and so clearly, we're concerned about our youth and, and prevention of development of elevated blood fat, obesity, high blood pressure, smoking habit in kids and the health behaviors that go along with these risk characteristics. Children and heart risk factors seem to make strange bed partners. But existing evidence indicates that atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, begins in childhood, even though the end results of the atherosclerotic progression usually do not become evident until later in life. So how do we approach prevention? It is uh, our idea that if, that if people are provided with information, that that's a part of the goal, it's quite clear that that's not enough. 90% of junior high school students know that smoking is bad for them, that they go on taking up smoking. So education is not enough. Providing people with skills, skills training of various sorts, skills example, providing them with alternative choices. For example, if you go to a school cafeteria and you have yogurt plus 12% ice cream. If you have a salad bar versus macaroni and cheese, whatever, combine opportunities with educational strategies, uh, combine manipulation by democratic means of the environment in providing choices and alternatives, plus the education, that that should do it, whereas neither will do it alone. Mm. Is there a role for government in this? Clearly a role for government, a government of the people and of informed citizens. So the educational role and the counseling role and the caring role is first. Uh, we're now involved in community strategies uh, to demonstrate in a research design how communities can be helped to uh, improve their community behavior. And our community boards are already very activist and they're already thinking about legislation. We're encouraging them to think first about care of the people and then about legislation. Mm -hmm. Legislation that would increase the physical facilities, the walking paths, that would discourage smoking in elevators, which is not universal yet, as you know. This sorts of legislation by informed citizens. I guess some of the things that government has been doing have actually been harmful. For instance, the support of the tobacco industry. Wouldn't that be a governmental action that's negative in a sense that we ought to consider trying to, to counter? I think there is clearly a, a subsidies question in the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. The primary health one that was raised very strongly by the, by the former secretary of HEW and the former administration, and that has gone by the by. I think there are other more subtle uh, areas of labeling of foods which need to be given in terms of their nutrient content, salt, fat content, and in terms of their uh, health value, which is not allowed at all, uh, grading, uh, regulations on advertising. There are a number of areas where government can effectively help the citizen make informed choices mm -hmm. without necessarily forcing those choices on the citizen. Being offered choices is one thing. Knowing which one to make is another. It's often difficult for each of us as individuals to understand our role in the scheme of prevention. 
let alone that prevention begins in childhood. Bill Strong and Bill Costelli are in agreement that good nutrition early and throughout life is one of the keys to heart health. But getting kids to realize that what they eat and how much they exercise today may determine whether or not they suffer from heart disease as adults tomorrow is a difficult task. Well, as your overall recommendation for young parents or parents of young children, what would be your prescription for diminishing the risks for later heart disease? Well, I think you have to use the precepts of uh, avoiding evil and doing good. And what it amounts to is certainly watching the way children eat and eating appropriately, the proper amount of nutrition, avoiding excesses as far as the carbohydrates, the fats are concerned, and even as far as the protein is concerned. Getting the right amount of physical activity or as much physical activity as possible. And to encourage this from as early an age as possible. And certainly something that we haven't touched on is the aspect of making sure that they avoid the smoking habit. And when you look at the smoking statistics, Children smoke if their parents smoke. Peers have something to do with it, but an older role model has more of an effect on whether or not a child smokes. So if we can have proper nutrition, the good exercise, physical activity, and avoid smoking, those are probably the three primary things we can do for children to hopefully prevent chronic disease later on in life. I'm looking at the walls of your heart the thickness of the walls, the motion at your heart valves, how well they're opening and closing. Adam Wildavsky, the author of Doing Better and Feeling Worse, has said the medical system affects only about 10% of the usual indices for measuring health, whether you live at all, how well you live, how long you live. The remaining 90% are determined by factors over which doctors have little or no control. Chief among these factors determining our health is individual lifestyle. So the message coming at us from every corner of the health arena is that improved health is largely an individual responsibility for which the guidelines in terms of nutrition and other health habits are becoming clearer. Well, the Heart Association message and many other messages are relatively simple and appropriate. The composition of the eating pattern we're talking about is somewhat lower in fat, higher in plant sources, and lower in salt, and that's the basic message. Mm -hmm. Lower in concentrated calories, uh, such as sugar and alcohol. The food choices at the market, the food preparation, uh, and the family customs and habits are the next phases of that, and uh, it's simply uh, a return to to an emphasis on plant foods, particularly the beans, complex carbohydrate starches, fruits and vegetables and nuts area, an emphasis on milk products but low-fat milk products, an interest on, uh, in meats but on fish, poultry and lean meat cuts, an interest in using meats and cheeses as condiments rather than the sole only center entree course for a meal and uh, some reduction in the meat centered meals. Mm -hmm. This gives all the protein and all the good quality protein plus all the other advantages we're talking about. Low fat, low calorie, low salt. What about exercise? What's your general you know, prescription for a reasonable level of physical activity? I really like to think of the energy expended, the energy spent, in the same framework as the energy taken in. I don't think one should ever consider diet separately from exercise or physical fitness separate from nutrition. I think they're so uh, interrelated. I think what we're talking about here is encouraging people to be vigorously active as youths and maintaining that vigorous activity. I think we're encouraging, encouraging older people who have been sedentary to be more active, vigorously active if they want to be in very gradual, uh, carefully supervised programs. 
but encouraging them to be uh, very active uh, in the moving about type, type of activity, so that uh, walking, essentially. We think that moving about at work, moving from stand-up desk to sit-down desk, uh, climbing stairs instead of elevators, a brisk walk daily is the appropriate exercise for the sedentary middle-aged individual, vigorous activity for youth, training and lifetime uh, sports activities, individual and small group rather than elitist team sports is the way to go. And I guess the other major factor that we've discussed along the way has been smoking. Do you see much possible way of getting to the, to the, to the problem as far as the number yeah, of kids? The two public health strategies are educational uh, to encourage cessation and prevention and the other is voluntary and regulatory changes in the cigarette itself and in mm -hmm. the tobacco itself. I've been more involved with the educational strategies than the regulatory. I think the educational approach uh, will pay off. Our prevention programs in seventh graders, and that's the age which uh, experimental smoking goes from 5% to 25% in the seventh grade. There's that rapid jump. Uh, educational programs using students, non-smoking students, as peer models, as role models, uh, devised here in Texas, as a matter of fact, by Dr. Evans' group, uh, enlarged in Stanford and Minnesota, been extremely effective in preventing kids from taking up smoking in the first place, and this effect has lasted up to three or four years now. Um, how many miles do you think you walk a day? If you've gotten the message and are following these guidelines, then you know we're repeating ourselves. But that's only because the stakes are so high. They touch on not only life itself, but also on the quality of that life. So why, if we're listening, aren't we acting? A friend of mine, his father one time, uh, I think said it best. He said, you know, when the motor's running good, I don't look under the hood. And uh, the sad thing about coronary disease is you're going to feel fine up until the very day of your heart attack. And even though we could have measured all these risk factors, you know, high cholesterol isn't painful. It turns out that high blood pressure isn't painful. And that smoking is not painful. In fact, it's quite the other way around. And so the pain begins actually when you go to change away from all these things. I think the ultimate message in Framingham is that the average person who's headed for a heart attack, a stroke, congestive failure, cardiovascular disease is not a mystery. That person, if they were to go to their doctor, any doctor in the country can do the tests. These are simple tests that would tell you whether your cholesterol is out of joint, whether your blood pressure is too high. You can look in your pocket and see if you've got a pack of cigarettes in there. Um, and if you're doing, and if you have problems in all those areas, and also let's add the stress, and let's add the lack of physical activity, um, if we're saying that if you were to measure these things, you can identify most of the people who are going to get a heart attack, a stroke, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years before that happens to them. And those people could change those factors because we're now seeing that if I lower your cholesterol, you do a lot better. If I lower your blood pressure, you do a lot better. It eliminates almost the stroke issue. If you quit smoking, Within a year, your risk of a heart attack goes all the way back to the risk you would have had had you never smoked. Of course, if you quit smoking for 15 years, your risk of lung cancer goes all the way back to the risk you would have had had you never smoked. So there's something you can do about all these things, and it's been successful in these small trials where people have done it, and I think we should be doing that. Do you work an eight hour day? The risks for heart disease are easily recognizable so are the health patterns that we need to alter. But giving up harmful habits isn't easy, and many of us won't start until after a heart attack. But that's like locking the barn door after the horse has long gone. Clearly, it would be better that the horse never got loose. Next time on Here's to Your Health, we'll be taking a closer look at one health risk factor, nutrition eating to live or living to eat.
This program was made with the advice and guidance of Dr. Norman Kaplan and produced in association with the University of Texas Health Science Center and Southwestern Medical School. Major funding for Here's to Your Health was provided by the Hillcrest Foundation with additional funding by HCA, Hospital Corporation of America, and American Hospital Supply Corporation.